All right. Well, I'm I'm just going to get us started. Uh, let's see. I wanted to just put up slides. Just welcome you. Um, we're just doing a quick overview of CAX's model site visit rubric. Um, uh, just so you know, this is something that um, CAX identified in our um, needs assessment and our members and other stakeholders identified it as a priority to create a site visit rubric. Um, and this is one of several products we're working on. Adam and Freddie also uh, have created an annual report template with, for us, uh, which we'll be sharing in a couple weeks. And then Lisa Jarvis led the effort to update our application package. And then we've worked with William Haft at uh, Tandem Education Partners on a revised model contract and a special education MOU. Uh, the contract and the MOU are still in process, but we're ready to share um, the rubric today. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, it's available on the web, so you can download it and start playing with it and using it. Um, and one thing I'd bring to everyone's attention is that we're calling this an interim edition. And the, the reason we're doing that is that we've created these during the COVID pandemic. And to be honest, uh, membership participation and feedback from the stakeholders wasn't as much as we would have done without the pandemic. And so we really wanna treat this as a living document this year and continue to welcome feedback and input. Uh, as people use it or get a chance to explore it, and then we'll plan to update it um, and have a more final final uh, probably next year. So we appreciate uh, that said, uh, quite a bit of work was done in advance of this. Um, one thing to know is that Adam and Freddie did a national scan for us of other people's reports and, and rubrics and other people's annual reports, and we were able to sort of give our feedback on that and talk about the pros and cons of different approaches. So quite a work, bit of work been put into this, but we look forward to making it more updated um, going forward. Um, and well, we'll get to that later, but let me just uh, stop. Anybody have any questions before we move and hand it off to Freddie and Adam to share what we're looking at? All right, uh, Freddie, how about if you, you want to walk us through? I can share a copy of it, or I can let you share if you want to drive. It is all good. I can share my screen. Um, Great. Yeah, although I think you have to enable me to share a screen. Oh, sorry. All good. Participants. All right, you should be able to do so now, Freddie. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, perfect. So this tool is a sample site visit rubric. And, um, you know, when we're thinking about site visits, I think, you know, we're thinking about it the way that most authorizers do. This is a chance for an authorizer to go into a school and collect data that they're going to use to inform authorizing related decisions. And so it's a combination of qualitative or more binary data and some potential qualitative data where they're collecting observations and things that might prompt later conversation with the school. Um, and so the rubric itself, though the intention of this document is to facilitate some sort of evaluation at some point, um, we did include in this document some assumptions about, you'll see here, the protocol for what actually happens during a site visit. And so we've laid out some steps of what we assume an authorizer is going to do prior to a site visit, during a site visit, following a site visit. And that really is intended to contextualize some of the items that we have included in the rubric, but it can also serve as guidance or maybe suggestions for the actual process that you follow for the site visit itself, even though this is really just the rubric. And so what we have here um, is a protocol for each of the elements of the rubric. So we've got a series of review topics. And for each of those things, we've identified how are you actually going about collecting those observations, those data um, to evaluate that particular review topic. And then the next section breaks down a little bit more what you basically see in this kind of summary section. 
So for each of the review topics, you have a reiteration of the review protocol. What needs to happen um, in order for the evaluator to actually collect the information that they need to evaluate this particular review topic. And then for each of the criteria, there is a series of scores um, that a school can potentially earn. And then an actual scoring guide. And one thing to note is that we're we've what we've uh, sort of laid out here allows for you to have some sort of score for each of the individual review topics rather than an overall score. Um, and that's really so that you have a more granular understanding of where you need to dig in more um, to understand the school's performance. And so that goes on, that's for each of the review topics. And so let's actually take a look again. So that's true for instruction, education program, school culture and discipline. Um, and then for governance, the layout of the rubric, I'll scroll down so you can see it, is a little bit different because at that point, you're looking at some, like, do they, yes or no, have certain policies and procedures in place? It's a little bit more binary. And so that is structured like a checklist you'll see here on page 15. So, you know, in terms of their basic legal obligations. safety is sort of similarly structured in that, you know, you're looking at whether they do or they don't have certain uh, protocols and measures in place. Another section I wanted to highlight um, is there, it, there are two sections that look at special education and one is up towards the uh, beginning of the document under instruction. The second one is um, it functions a little bit more like a checklist the way that the board legal obligations does. And basically this will allow the authorizer to go in, pull a series of files and actually review whether or not basic things are in place. Like is the IEP up to date? Is, I mean, and if it is, you check compliant. If not, it's not compliant. Um, and so you're basically spot checking uh, their special education files. And they'd be spot checking for like uh, a few different students, right? So this is designed to look at three different students, basically. You'll see student A, B, and C. Hey, Freddie, could you uh, stop for a second and explain the approach to the the, the summary points for how the points are added up a little bit? Sure. Let's go up to the top. So uh, for, let's take instruction, for example, um, you will total up, you know, you have, e for each of the criteria, you have a certain number of points that you can possibly earn. And, you know, you'll use it the way that you do any rubric. You'll give a total, um, just based upon you know what you're observing in the classroom. And then what we have at the bottom is a percentage of points earned out of total possible points earned. And based upon that, they've achieved some scoring level, exemplary, acceptable, needs improvement, or inadequate. So it's pretty straightforward. Um, okay, so based on that, overview of this document. Are there any particular sections that you guys would like to discuss? Before we dive in, I just want to bring, uh, I had one question or in the chat and how this will be available. So this is currently available like as a PDF or a Word file. So we're assuming we'd make the Word file available and the district would go um, adjust as they see fit for what makes sense and be able to use a lot of it off the shelf, but still have a chance to adjust it in Word um, without having to recreate stuff. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. So this is definitely intended to be, um, something that can be used, uh, exactly as it is now or, um, adapted to, you know, 
align with any rubric or tools or resources that the district already has in place for their authorizing process. Okay. Um, questions and, or particular places people want to look? I guess I, I would suggest we, we start with instruction. Um, sure. And I have one question. So sometimes the people in the authorizing staff are really experienced educators and former school leaders, and sometimes they're not. How do you think this will help someone who's not like a former teacher or a school leader, you know, make a judgments about instruction and education? Sure, absolutely. So let's see, what's a great spot to check, let's see. So something like the curriculum, um, so this is, um, uh, this particular section is interesting because it is both binary and something that will require a little bit of conversation with the school leader. And so um, basically an evaluator can go in and look at, okay, do they or do they not have um, a research-based curriculum in place? You know, if not, okay, so, excuse me. Um, and so once they have that basic understanding, then they can start to build on that. Um, and that can happen in document review, and they can also seek clarification from the school leader. Um, and that's part of why we note up here in the methodology of the actual review that they are observing in the classroom, they're conducting a document review, and they're also having a direct conversation with the person leading the school. And so the point of all of that is that they have a combination of ways to gather this information that can support them if, for example, something is not immediately evident to them based on a document review. Right, and then they can also, by checking out the curriculum in the documents and talking to the school leader, have a better sense of what they're looking for if that curriculum is being implemented. Absolutely. Right, yeah. so they get to triangulate between them. Exactly, yeah. So the point of having multiple ways of, oh, go ahead. Sorry, is there a place or a way to notate like what evidence was looked at that's a really good question to meet the, we don't, the we level. don't have that in this template but that's certainly something that you could add in i think yeah i i think that that would be um helpful if you were doing you know additional review following the site visit or something like that yeah i'm just thinking as a school leader if i received a one i would want to know what they looked at mm. and maybe what was missed um, that I could provide. Yeah, that's a great note. Tia, if I could yeah. give a suggestion, I think like what I would do is take, I'm already thinking I would take this um, document and edit into, you know, each section have another additional area where you would hyperlink the evidence, especially if it's documentation to some kind of Google Drive and because that's what I've been doing recently with my board and just having everything in one place and then you have that for verification going you know into whatever you're going to use this document for. Mm -hmm. The idea so you have both place with uh, the idea of having a place where the evaluator can actually fill out this is how I observed this. These are the data that I collected in order to arrive at the score. I think that's a great point. Yeah, or just another column. Mm -hmm. We do a lot of reviews at the league and we, our rubric like has a column where we can say like um, interviews and looking at the UIP reveal the lack of clear action planning or, you know. Certainly. Yeah. Just the nuance good. of filling out a rubric. Um, Mackenzie, can we come back to what you were mentioning about um, how you would go about collecting? Uh, you mentioned that you would want everything to live in a Google file so that you could reference that. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you would add to this document? Yeah, I guess it's just personal preference and organization, but um, typically whenever I do a site visit now, I just have a folder in my G Suite that has, um, you know, site visit for ABC school. And then by indicator number, I label the evidence that um, whatever documentation I used as evidence, I label that in the drive so that it's an, 
essentially like an appendices built in, um, linked into the document so that it's not 500 pages long. Yeah. Um, and then I give, it's really helpful to give it that way. I've, I've noticed to like board members or even the school leaders and just say, here's your finalized report. You know, it's, and, uh, and it has all the hyperlinks to the, um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm juggling a bottle. Um, it has all the hyperlinks to all of the evidence in the same place. Um, and I always save those things as PDFs so that they can't be changed or sharing, you know, be edited later on. Got it. I think that makes sense, Mackenzie. I like, I like having them be, you know, accessible from the document, but not making the document much longer. That seems like a good compromise to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the only issue I've run into is like recently I just had a job change. So a lot of the things that were, you know, the thing you just have to remember with file sharing is who owns those documents when you no longer own them anymore and how to make sure that they're still accessible to the public. Is this Mackenzie from Aurora? Yes, we chatted a yeah, while back. Okay. <laughs> I, I remember that you were going on maternity leave. I just don't know if that was. Uh, yes. <laughs> Welcome back. And um, you were really helpful when we were doing the national scan. So happy to have you. Thanks. Um, no, but I, that, but Mackenzie's last point is good because she's now at Douglas County. And so mm -hmm. um, it's always an issue of transition and where, where the Google drives live and who owns them. Um, in, in addition to marshaling all the evidence. So that's a good point, Mackenzie. Oh, Mackenzie, let me raise another issue. When we were working on the annual report template, you were uh, pretty helpful in clarifying how much we should not have it add stuff up automatically. And the approach in this document is fairly straightforward and does add it up and then does lead to the scores based on, um, you know, you, you see their exemplary at 75% plus. Um, we're assuming people could make value judgments and adjust the, the numbers there. And they could also, you know, use different alternative numbering systems. Do you have any reactions to us creating a template like this that does spell out all the numbers and then does suggest, you know, what, what words to use depending on percentages? Um, it, this is a tough one, um, but I, I think my initial gut reaction is I've had issues using a numeric scoring system in the past. Um, really for one reason, which is how we're, how did, how did we develop those and who's to say that's exemplary or not. Um, so I think in this case, I would just be prepared to have to um, explain why is exemplary 75 and why is, you know, why are the categories there um, and how are they labeled that way? And mm -hmm. I've said before, if I can't, um, come up with a good reason or there's no research base for it, I don't feel comfortable usually putting it in to my documents, um, but that's just a personal preference um, and switching from that to um, more of a narrative uh, response so that, you know, I think about what is the end goal of this and it's different for every authorizer. So that's the caveat to my comment is in my context, these were used for making renewal decisions and things like that. So it, it was not really my role at the time to say, this school has a green rating or uh, exemplary rating. My role was to say to our board of education, this is, the, and this is the information I collected. This is the evidence I have. Board of education, you can go and make a decision about this. Um, but that, again, that was my context. And I think that that's different everywhere you go. Sure. So there will be many contexts where this would be very helpful to have a numeric score. But potentially with the template, it would be helpful to emphasize that authorizers should either use or not use the scoring system that we have suggested here based on, you know, whatever policies and procedures they as a district already have in place. Yeah, I think it would be wise to put some kind of disclaimer about that. Yeah, I, I, and I think the key is sort of to be intentional about it because I, I, I can see, depending on the context, very good calls in both directions in terms of going narrative versus going numeric. 
and also, you know, thinking about it as a former board member of an authorizer having to vote. I'm like, oh, I'd sure like to see the, the summed up part of the dashboard. So another, that's a really good point. Another system that I saw during the national scan, and I'm not suggesting that this is, I think that this actually complicates things too much, but it is like on the spectrum of, you know, possible things you can do um, with ki this kind of tool is um, uh, that one district had, um, like weighted points for each of the criteria that you were evaluating. So some sort of, for, for example, like an automatic flag for the district that there should be some sort of like, uh, you know, action from the district to either support the school or potentially, you know, give them some sort of warning or something like that. Um, and then, uh, you know, criteria that they wanted to monitor, but wouldn't necessarily trigger some sort of automatic response from the district. Um, you know, so I, I found that to be, to like invite even more, I think, unnecessary complexity, but it is, I, I did see a few districts do it. I, I, I like that in it. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> I, I just wanted to give a two cent comment on that because I did, we used to do that in Aurora. Um, I'll have to come back to this, sorry. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I'm Mackenzie. I think I share your biases here, and I've generally been like an anti-scoring zealot. And I'll say that there's we do a lot of work in Texas, and some districts there, like the way they make their school performance frameworks, it's I mean it's just extraordinary. It's like you've combined every element to cause confusion. There's a floor, there's a target, there's points, there's a weight. It's like the math is just impossible, it's crazy making. It's yeah. like, I, I don't, I get that maybe to some people, it adds a veneer of science to this, which maybe feels good. But I think that it, it also creates a opacity that I think is tough. But, you know, we're trying to sort of strike the middle ground here. And that's obviously why we have the, so many of the, the organizational, like the compliance type things, just at the binary. Um, but it's easier said than done to find the right balance. Well, what I was gonna say about the what Freddie was talking about is that in our application process, we had something similar where we didn't have weighted scoring, but we had particular indicators that were at, had an asterisk that they were considered critical components, meaning if they did not meet these particular things, this was a serious concern, for example, you know, not equitably serving students with special needs versus do your teachers have IDs for on their lanyard? Like different different things that we're looking at in a site visit, not to say that that's not important, but that's something that could be fixed in 24 hours versus, you know, you haven't been serving kids with special needs for months or years, whatever the case may be. And so that's, it did work for us in that realm, but we also didn't attach a score. Again, it was just kind of like a notation. Yeah. Yeah. I'll add one other thing too that's incorporated in this um, to that. There, there's aspects of this rubric that are sort of broken out that you probably wouldn't want to look at with a school that had been high performing for the last two or three years. And so some of it is uh, designed to be a little conditional based on how the school has been performing from other data that you have. Um, those are really helpful uh, notes, everybody. Um, okay. Any other questions on uh, the rubric? I mean, I realize that this is, you know, there are like a lot of elements about uh, something like a site, even a site visit rubric that we can talk about. Um, but are there, is there anything in particular that you all want to focus on next? The other thing that I would say too is that, um, you know, you can, I think probably it's helpful to spend time reviewing the document just on your own, just reading through the entire thing. Um, and so, you know, you can always reach out to Alex who can, 
you know, forward questions along to us, you can reach out to us directly, of course, with questions. Um, we're happy to continue the conversation beyond today. I have one quick yeah, question. I'm delighted. Go ahead, Mackenzie. It's very quick. Um, what is the intended person, who is the intended person to be using this document? Is it is it the authorizer, like the authorizer staff person, or is it a, a team of experts in all of these areas from the district? Like what, was it formed around assuming just kind of one person could handle this and do this without having the expertise in all these areas? This was designed with a pretty small staff in mind. Um, and so, you but know- But not okay. one person. Not any okay. particular person, but assuming- You're Kind of the middle, yeah. Right. But this and is- In talking, for example, with CSI, you know, we like, we were not thinking like CSI type scale but right. also not the opposite extreme where you have one person or one person and administrative support. Thank you, that's helpful. That's actually, that's one of, one of the hardest design features I think in this. It is. Because from our experience with authorizers in Colorado, y'all vary significantly in terms of the size of your teams and also the experience of the staff on the teams. Yeah, and they also vary in terms of one of the things the, the severely understaffed people do is then call on other district staff to help in different authorizing parts of it. Um, and so usually they'll leave um, someone who's in charge of federal grants and programs in charge of the overview of those things. Uh, and it's not necessarily done in a site visit or coordinated fashion, but you'd get more information from, let's say, in particular, the special education team about how that's going. And that would be done separately. Um, can I shift the discussion to another point? Um, uh, and again, we look forward to getting tons of feedback once people have a chance to read through it more and, you know, treating it like a living document. But what do you think um, would be the best way to provide technical assistance for people and how to use this? Uh, and keep in mind, um, in our COVID world right now, like what, what do you think it'll take for people to learn how to use this and get it adopted? Mackenzie, Key, any ideas? I would say somebody needs to take it on um, full force and adopt it and use it and then do um, training with the rest of the group on how it worked for them and what they would do differently. Plus, I think a real life example would be the most effective. Yeah, I was thinking along the same lines. So a model. Um, I'm happy to be that guinea pig. <laughs> That's so generous. So it is then. Yeah, and yeah. with COVID, it could be done, you know, video. Yeah, videos of what an observation looks like in a classroom yeah. and um, the types of documents that they may review. Is there a list of like docu suggested documents or is it just a general review documents? Oh, uh, that's a great question. I don't think it has a current list of the bibliography of things that would be assembled. Right, Adam and Freddie? Do you mean We'd have in, to create that in as a rubric? Well, as like a supplemental yeah, like a, tool to using the rubric, like you should wow. collect. I see. Lesson uh, plans, the budget, the board minutes, the... Uh, yeah, so each of the um, review topics does include in the protocol what you are doing to actually collect data. Um, okay, the specific so documents. Yeah, and so that's embedded in the document itself. And then, for example, something like, you know, um, board tools, or excuse me, uh, let's see, board legal obligations. Um, you have... Yeah, you have these basic instructions underneath the review protocol, and then you know your checklist of what they do or do not have. But it's a, it may be helpful it's a to have point. a list of documents that the school would gather prior to the review. That like would in preparing. Nice. Yeah. In preparing for their site visit. Correct. Yeah, it's a good idea.
Um, Mackenzie's question is, how often would you use this? The idea is something like annually. At least not, certainly not more frequently than that. Yeah. And I could see trying to move districts in the direction of doing that. And then some starting out with doing it in year three and four of the renewal cycle or doing it in year one and four. Um, but ideally you want to get something that's workable annually, I think. Any other thoughts on that from other people? Um, Alex, I, sorry, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but I really do want to let you know that I'm, you know, being in a new environment, um, I'm in a really great position to be able to um, work through designing a better site visit protocol for Douglas County in particular, uh, mostly because it doesn't really exist. <laughs> um, yes. And so, um, so I would like to kind of, um, I don't know if it would help this project in any way or help CAXA, but I would really like to take this um, in front of, you know, tweak it to make it work for us, but also then take it in front of my charter school principals and, um, and get their feedback on this because I think that collaborative effort is really helpful too when you're getting feedback from school leaders on, on things. Um, and so I'm happy to do that. I don't know if it helps this project or the greater good, but um, I don't know if anyone else is doing that. Um, but that's definitely like high on my priority list this year. No, that sounds, I was gonna say the, especially the whole interim thing, given COVID. I mean, it's great to have Kia on the mm -hmm. phone in our, on our, here. We have gotten feedback during the development, but not much. And I think, you know, partnering with a district that partners with its schools to, to see how to use it and apply it is a great idea. And we, we can definitely, that's the sort of thing we're hoping to do this year. So uh, yeah. kudos to you and, and we'd partner with you on it. Mackenzie, well, you have like 20 charter schools, 19 charter schools, something like that? Yeah, and they're all very, um, they're all really involved in collaborative. And also, you know, you may be aware of that there's also the Alliance in Douglas County. Um, so there's a lot of efforts to be collaborative and work on projects. And I'm proposing a couple things in front of schools um, here in the next few weeks that I've gotten really good feedback on. They really just wanna be a part of the conversation. And I found a lot of value in that even in the short time I've been there. So I, I think it would be in my best, in, well, not mine, but in the district's best interest in the schools to put this in front of them, um, especially because we don't have anything. Um, this is really not something that's been used before. Mm -hmm. well, that sounds great. And, and Kia, we'd be, we'll, we'll share it with the other CAXA members and hopefully get several that are giving it a try but we'd be eager in all those cases to, you know, facilitate getting the school's input as well and hope to have that kind of dialogue. For Freddie and Adam, what their district had, we know we have the Colorado League of Charter Schools as a statewide organization. The charter schools within Doug Co district have their own sub subgroup uh, that meets and acts collectively. So that's what the alliances in Doug Co, which isn't something we usually have everywhere, but it's unique to Doug Co and it's a good idea. So expect to see more of that. Interesting. That's cool. Yeah. Um, any other ideas? So I love the idea of partnering, love the idea of iterating uh, with both the districts and the charters and some settings. That's what we'd hoped we'd be able to do more of. Um, and so that's perfect. Um, the other thing is to think about, we'll be sharing the annual report template um, in a couple of weeks. And that's also up there now on how to integrate those. I know Mackenzie and your say, you guys have a recently updated performance framework and all of that. Um, but so we're, we are anticipating that these two tools fit together in a site that rubric sort of informs the annual report template um, and they, they match. So we'll be unveiling those and we'll probably be expect some districts to explore trying to fit those two things together. Oh, and then the, the final part I would say also interesting, Mackenzie, for, for, for Doug Co, is how well does this integrate into something like Epicenter or Charter Tools? Mm -hmm. And can the reporting that you do that gathers all the instruments or all the documents through Charter Tools, I think it is, in Doug Co, um, can that be yep. aligned to this and fit together? So 
Yeah, it's it's easy. Um, I mean, it's a lot of build work, but it's once it's built, um, it could be replicated with other districts who use the same uh, program. And you you have charter tools, is what Duckcoat adopted last year, right? Yes. And um, okay. yeah, it would be um, you know I think it would be cool if a, if we had collectively people in CAXA wanting to use this, I think anybody who's using the, actually, I think it's just Doug calling Aurora, <laughs> but if anybody in the future, yeah. I think it'd be easily uh, able to replicate that. Oh, look at that in the back of Adam. Nice job. He's preparing for Halloween. Is that, <laughs> that's excellent. Is <laughs> like your um, costume, buddy? Yeah, so um, this is an excellent focus group. Uh, I feel like we've had a good feedback and great ideas. Um, I'm excited to partner, you know, with the league and Doug Co and other other people going forward. And um, I think Adam and Freddie have set us up really well for both these tools to be a good starting point. And like I said, I expect them to evolve over the year. So, um, any other questions or comments for the good of the order? All right. Um, well, I think Mackenzie wins. Thank you, the, this is awesome. Oh, go ahead. No, I'm just excited. So thank uh, you guys. Yeah, I, say, I think Mackenzie won the Zoomy Award for the best sound effects of the small baby in the background, and Adam wins the best um, uh, walk-on appearance in the Zoomy Awards for today. So. Thank you. Hold on. Here's the cutest award. Oh. oh. That is really cute, actually. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So stopper. <laughs> Darling. Oh. Have a great weekend with all your little ones. And um, all right. thanks again, Adam and Freddie. And, and Kia, thanks to you. And the other, Alex, I got your notes as well. Us. So I got the email. All right. Bye, Thank everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye.